You're listening to a stage talk titled Tracking Deforestation with Open Data. This week, we were joined by journalist Luis Fernando Toledo, who has spent time recently investigating cases of deforestation in Brazil. He worked with publications in Brazil like Piauí and large investigative collectives like the OCCRP and the ICIJ to uncover the scale of wrongdoing and missed accountability within this industry. In the talk, we explored his research techniques and findings, but he also gave some sound advice on getting started in environmentally focused investigations. You can find all the links mentioned in the talk in the description of this podcast. The talk was hosted by me, Charlotte Ma, on Thursday, the 29th of August, 2024, in the Bellingcat Discord server. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's stage talk. Today, I'm joined by freelance investigative journalist and researcher at the Cambridge Centre of Development Studies, Luis Fernando Toledo. Luis has a master's in data journalism from Columbia University and has spent the last few years publishing investigations into the hidden world of deforestation offenders. He specializes in using open data methods to uncover gaps in regulation systems that are allowing companies and individuals to pursue environmental damage without consequences. For the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICFJ, for example, Louise recently revealed how environmental certifications were still given to companies that have committed environmental crimes in Brazil. Today's talk will hopefully provide you with some insight into the scale of the issue at hand and demonstrate how you can use research techniques to cover environmental crimes and deforestation in general yourself. As we talk, please put your questions in the chat, as I just mentioned, and I'll ask them as we move into the Q&A section. Reminder that if you do not want me to mention your username, please mention that in your question. Now I'm going to hand over the mic to Luis, who is going to detail some of his most recent investigations. Luis. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Can you hear me? Okay, so I'm a reporter who has worked for around 10 years with public policies in Brazil, in various areas such as crime, education, and more recently, the environment beat. Today, I continue covering my country, but I'm based in London for several media outlets. Before I begin, I just want to clarify that I'm not primarily an environmental reporter. I'm a reporter who loves public records and data, using them to uncover stories whenever possible. However, due to certain professional paths and partnerships, most of my recent work has focused on environmental issues. Before leaving Brazil, I worked for several media outlets, and also created a non-profit organization in partnership with other journalists, specializing in obtaining data and documents through our access to information law, something like the Freedom of Information Act in the US or the FOI in the UK. Uh, Later, I created another project called datafixers.org, specializing in data in Brazil with funding from the Brown Institute for Media Innovation, an institute based at Columbia University and other partners. The goal of this project is to produce stories and assist other journalists in crafting their own by obtaining the necessary documents and data from any Brazilian agencies, companies, and other sources. It's important to say that Brazil is a giant country with many, many challenges in its journalistic coverage, but we are also, in a way, an example of transparency and open data. A lot of information is already available on the internet and can be extremely useful in finding exclusive stories. I want to use this presentation today to bring some examples and encourage anyone interested in investigating environmental crimes in the Amazon or other Brazilian regions to use these open source websites and methodologies. Even if you are not from Brazil, and I think most of you are not from Brazil, I hope the strategies that I will share here will help you find stories that connect Brazil to your country. This is increasingly relevant, especially when it comes to deforestation, climate change, and environmental crimes. The examples I will share have one thing in common. People and companies that sell their products in the United States and Europe and other regions presenting themselves as sustainable, environmentally conscious, law-abiding, but they often fail to explain or even know the origin of the products they sell. How did we manufacture them? Or where the raw material came from? Another common thread is that all these projects relied on open data, public records, and many, many freedom of information requests. 
I, I'm going to repeat this this thing all the time: freedom of information, FOIA, etc. Because I use it a lot. Uh, I have been working to find these networks, the supply chains, and expose uh, that this solid image these companies present in rich countries may be hiding a trail of environmental crimes and even violence against people, animals in other countries, such as Brazil. This applies to almost everything. The timber used use for tables, chairs, and decks in New York, violin bowls crafted for use in London and Belgium, rare indigenous artifacts that you can see in museums in Germany or that are sold online in online stores around the world. In some countries like the US, there are laws stating that if an action constitutes an environmental crime in the country of origin, then it's also considered a crime there. It's worth keeping an eye on cases involving those countries, if then, if, if, even if they occur in Brazil, for example. I believe some other countries have similar law. And where should I start a project like this? Many of these stories can be investigated with a combination of interviews, research into official sources, data cross-referencing. There's no need to have a super source who works in a high-ranking government position or a company or having a huge leak in your heads. Of course, you could have a leak. Sometimes it's better, but you don't really need to start with something huge like a leak or a, or a source like that. All the stories that I have participated in over the last three years almost always started with a, a hypothesis and questions that arose from reading reports, analyzing spreadsheets, talking to normal people. Of course, the data was just the beginning of the investigation. A lot of on the field reporting happen, happened in some of the stories. Some traditional investigative reporting steps too, like talking to former employees from companies or government agencies. But having something you have found in public records before an interview is always an advantage. If you have data, use it to start the conversation. Make your source interested in what you're doing. It's much better. People often say that every story is, is unique, and that's true. Every project is different. But what I try to think, I like to say that there's always a journalistic methodology to follow, even if, if it ultimately leads to different paths. So how to get this data and public records in Brazil? We have a powerful access to information law, or FOIA, which allows anyone to request data and documents from any public department, and in some cases, even data from companies that receive public funds. It's free to use. Anyone can request it regardless of their country of origin. Uh, this is a recent law, only approved in 2012 in Brazil. Other Latin American countries approved similar laws a decade earlier. In the United States, for example, such a law has existed for more than 50 years. FOIA, famous FOIA. However, being late has brought us some advantages. By arriving later, most documents and data have already been digitized. In Brazil, there is a single, just one website to send questions to any federal public agency and even some municipal and state agencies. Questions are usually answered within 30 days and only a few agencies are late. So this is, this is great for investigative journalists. This is very, very useful. Don't expect or to get all the documents you are asking for. To increase your chances, it's important to find alternatives, interview sources before, so they can explain where to get the information and how. Learn how documents are named, how data is organized. Bureaucracy is a puzzle. You need, we need to understand each piece. Precisely because the Freedom of Information Act is a new law in Brazil, only a few journalists take advantage of the law and prefer to follow the more traditional path of reporting. In 2021, I received this scholarship to study data journalism in the United States, and that's where uh, I learned how to program in Python. I won't say that programming is mandatory, but it makes everything so much easier for investigative reporters. You can scrape an entire website and its data, transform it in a spreadsheet, gathering social media data, create dashboards to help your colleagues in a project, analyze historical trends, cross-reference huge data sets, monitor websites even without looking at it all day. These are just some examples. So, And it was during that program that I realized the environmental beat would be the best way to attract interest from journalists in other countries, as Brazil, especially in the Amazon region, is consistently on the radar of reporters in the United States and Europe. During this degree at Columbia University, I was invited to help a professor, Janina Segnini, in one project. She was investigating the illegal export of garbage from the United States to Brazil. 
I helped her team to obtain, through the access uh, to information law, copies of several environmental files and reports that proved that there had been such an export of garbage by a large company, including pictures. It was during this project that I discovered a very powerful research source that I'm going to talk about, which became the main source of almost all the stories I have produced in the last three years. It's the Brazilian Environmental Crime Database. Brazil has two main government institutes that monitor environmental crimes, IBAMA and ICNBio. IBAMA is spelled A-B-A-M-A, and ICNBio is spelled I-C-M-B-I-O. These two government agencies are responsible for imposing fines on those who commit illegal deforestation, export wood illegally, sell materials take for, taken from endangered species, uh, there are other agencies, of course, but the main sources are these two, IBAMA and ICNBio. All these environmental fines, along with the paper trail detailing what happened, are public. This is, again, like an advantage of covering Brazil. You can see, you can get a lot of public information for free. Part of this information is available in the huge spreadsheets in the CSP format, and it's and it also available in a shapefile format, which can be opened in software such as such as key GIS. Details of each case can be requested through the access to information law. So to do these stories, we need all the formats, the CSV to identify potential interesting cases, the shape file to map those cases and look for insights, and the Freedom of Information Act to get more details about the cases we want to highlight. The spreadsheet contains the basic data of people and companies such as their full name and ID, which crime they committed, where, and the date when it happened. It's a good practice for journalists to cross-reference the spreadsheet, which is updated daily by the federal government with other databases, such as tax exemptions given by the government, politicians and their companies. In Brazil, you can see the politician ID, so you can cross-reference those databases, public employees, etc. So you can find who from those people, is being investigated in, for environmental damage and maybe find a potential story. This is where the first project I want to talk about comes in. I was part of a project coordinated by ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, in 2023 called Deforestation Inc. The project, or at least the Brazilian part of the project, was based on that specific data set, the Environmental Crime Data Set in Brazil. The main conclusion of the project was that major environmental auditing firms ignore or fail to recognize environmental damage caused, caused by loggers and other clients whose practice they certify as sustainable, undermining an elaborate global system meant to fight deforestation and climate change. The project involved 39 media partners, including three Brazilian news outlets. I was responsible for coordinating the data analysis for the Brazilian news outlet. So I can't speak for the other countries, but I can say that Brazilian had a very important role in this project. To establish a, a starting point for that project, we decided to focus on only one of these certifications, the Forest Stewardship Council, or FSC, which is an international non-government organization dedicated to promoting responsible management of the world's forests. Since its foundation in 1994, in their own words, FSC has grown to become the world's most respected and widespread forest certification system. According to the organization itself, they are pioneer, pioneers in certificating systems that enables business and consumers to choose wood, paper, and other forest projects made with material that support responsible forestry. So uh, our organization like that shouldn't be involved with companies that have committed environmental crimes, right? At the time of our investigation, the FSC provided an online dashboard with data separated by country where it was possible to see all the companies that had the certification and when they got the certification. So we, we scraped the data from the website to convert to the spreadsheet. We shared that spreadsheet with all the partners and then we cross-referenced the list of environmental fights from Ibama in Brazil and the other countries involved in farming and in their own context. To do this, we use the technique called fuzzy matching in Python. It searches for similar terms in different data tables and then aggregates that data based on proximity. This was necessary because sometimes there were slight differences how the company names were written. 
what we identified dozens of names. Then we manually checked whether they were the same companies. To obtain more details of the cases, our reporter submits requests through the Freedom of Information Law to obtain copies of each fine and search court records regarding the company's owners. As a result, we found companies with SSC certification that have already been convicted for land grabbing in indigenous lands, illegal deforestation, timber laundering, a fraud scheme that's very common in Brazil. Companies that have been fined several times, yet FSC certification had not been cancelled after the fines were issued. Some company owners have been arrested for environmental crimes, but kept their certification. So uh, this project, uh, only using data, of course, we, we did uh, 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 all the field reporting after that, but the data was the, the starting point, and we found several inter interesting cases that we could highlight. In another project for PLE, a major Brazilian magazine, we used similar environmental finance data from ICMBio. Again, this is the source of many, many potential stories. A Brazilian public institute responsible for monitoring conservation units with protected species. But in this case, the spreadsheet seemed to have an error that in data journalism, we commonly refer as missing data. Nearly half of the environmental crimes were not attributed to any person or company. They were either left blank or listed as unknown author. To confirm if this was indeed a data issue, I select some cases without a known name and requested copies of these files from the government through the Freedom of Information Law. The result confirmed that they had no information on the individuals involved. It was not a data problem. It was a public policy problem and a story for us. How is it possible to sanction someone without knowing who that person is? Is the government simply pretending to do something? Acting on a tip from a source, we discovered there was a way to identify landowners at least in one place, the state of Pará in Brazil, one of the states with the highest levels of deforestation in the country and a key supplier of beef to the global market. There was this local government website that allowed, allowed to visualize rural properties data through individual searches and also via shapefile. So I had two spatial files. One shapefile with the locations where environmental crimes had occurred, created by the federal government, but without the author's name. And there was this another shapefile with the names of the landowners in the state of Pará, produced by a local government, including the exact location of each farm. So we just had to intersect those uh, shapefiles, and then we would know the name and the crime, something that I assumed that the government would do but later, a source warned me that data sharing is not exactly something that is very common in the government. So, okay, the federal government has this database, the state government has another database, but they don't speak to each other. So a journalist can do that. You get simple merge technique in QGIS. We identified more than 30 names of people and companies who were responsible for large-scale deforestation in the state of Pará. Based on those findings, the government, as far as I could track, has already fined at least five companies, millions of Brazilian reais for illegal deforestation. Finally, I want to mention one last example that also used a similar methodology, relying on open data, where we identified a large group of companies exporting Brazil wood to manufacture violin bowls and sell them in the United States and Europe. The story began with a press release issued by the federal government announcing the seizure of a large quantity of wood at Brazil's largest airport. However, the press release did not mention any names, only saying that a major manufacturer was involved. Using the data, the date of the incident, the quantity of wood seized at a location, I was able to identify one of the offenders. His name appeared in the environmental crime database. Again, I mentioned earlier. And began investigating, I began investigating him by reviewing court cases filed against him. I discovered that he was just one of many sellers, part of a network that included several others, some with connections to well-known musicians in Brazil and abroad. I submitted so many FOIA requests regarding these cases that after a few weeks, a source familiar with my requests just reached out to me, confirming I was on the right track. The source began guiding me on what to request next. So sometimes we are using FOIA, but we are also talking to someone. They are guiding us what to ask exactly, to, to where should we ask. And 
what is the question we need to ask? So I managed to map out the entire supply chain, revealing the story where the wood, wood came from, a park in the state of Bahia, and how it eventually ended up in a store in London. We interviewed people in both in both places, Bahia and London, and the story was published by OCCRP, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. So just to finish my speech, all these examples demonstrate that even with official data, it's possible to draw conclusions that go beyond and sometimes even challenge the official narrative. And not all these stories are the same. There, There's always some steps we can try to follow to get the information we need. So uh, uh, even if each story is different, we I, I, I like to think that there is a methodology in journalism. There isn't just one government. There are city governments, state governments, the federal government, along with the Congress, the judiciary, the public prosector's office. Many public policies and records are interconnected. So if we can't find what we are looking for from one source, we should seek out from other sources. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Luis. That was so interesting. And yes, definitely. You can see the methodology there. It's also frustrating to hear that the the departments of government don't talk to each other. I think that's a common theme that uh, seen across the globe, actually. I wanted to first start off the questioning asking uh, actually about the end result, because in a lot of cases where you're covering environmental crimes or destruction, it can feel pointless in some cases and like you're screaming into a void uh, because of the scale of these kinds of gaps in legislation and also um, the destruction in itself. But you mentioned in the landowners uh, ownership investigation where you were looking into the lack of clarity on owners of the land that had been deforested, you noted that that, uh, in that investigation you actually did find uh, quite a number of the owners and that the government appeared to have uh, fined five of them. How do you ensure when you've tracked down some of that missing data that your reporting has an impact on the ground and is used to rectify some of those issues? How did you push uh, the government on that particular story? So in this case, I, th I think the, the strategy was to talk with the people who were responsible for sanctioning the landowners. So I was investigating and talking to them. So, uh, and they gave me more tips and I came back to my investigation. I had like several months to do that. So I wanted to make sure that when I published a story, I had material enough to make sure that they had what they needed to sanction those companies. So uh, I think this, this helped a lot because I knew exactly what I needed because I was talking to those people. Uh, I didn't know, for example, that the federal government and the state government were not talking. The source told me that this happened, so that's why I decided to to merge the, the, the two shape files. So I think what, one of the important things is to make sure that you have all the details, make sure that you have all the information you need. And of course, uh, it, it won't be guaranteed. Maybe they would just ignore my story. But I think in this case, it would be impossible to ignore because I was talking to the people responsible for for sanctioning the company. So how could they ignore something that they were helping me? So I think in this specific case, and, and, and as you said, it's like, it's, it's just something, I, I was expecting that they would sanction many more people because I found 30 cases, they they sanctioned it only five. I don't know about the rest of the, what happened to the rest of these landowners. And this was something that I found in third, three or four months, but I think, like if they investigate more, they could find many more people. But what I like to say about this story is that the most important impact was not the the people who are sanctioned, but the methodology. Because now they know that they should talk more with the state of Pará. They should speak more with, with people from other states and update their data. Because uh, this was done by just one person who is not even specialized in mapping. So they can do much, much more. So I think like changing the way the the changing the way that the, these investigations are made it is more helpful than just sanctioning one or two people. And just on that topic, uh, on that particular investigation, I thought it might be useful for people who might not be as familiar with the, the issue of deforestation and particularly the issue of deforestation in the Amazon. Um, how are the embargoes or the sanctions, as you mentioned, meant to work? Um, how, how are they meant to be implemented and how do they affect land use? Oh, in, in the, there were different cases. In, in this case, like the, this person 
in first place, this person was shouldn't be uh, uh, in that land. So the land grabbed it, that area from the government. It, it's a public area, but they allegedly said it was theirs. Uh, and they uh, that, that's how the process happened in Brazil. They they occupy land and then they start to uh, destroy the forest and they put cattle there. And after a few years, they ask the government to give them the area. So sometimes it works, but in this case, it didn't. So the government uh, found that there was deforestation in that specific area. They sanctioned the area, but that's the problem. They they put a sanction, but they didn't know who was the owner. So it was more like a rhetorical sanction because nobody was going to pay for that. So the, the piece that was missing was to find a person because in Brazil... You can sanction, I think, like, I don't know how it works in other countries, but it's impossible to sanction a piece of land. Of course, you can like uh, uh, put a sanction where people wouldn't be able to get loans from banks to do something in that land. If you have cattle in that land, it could be seized by the, the authorities. But in terms of giving a fine, in terms of sanctioning someone, arresting someone, you need a name a name from a person or a company. So the piece that was missing was that, like having someone responsible for that area. Um, as I expected, we're getting questions on FOI uh, requests. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, is there any uh, common pitfalls that you see people falling into when filing FOI requests? Um, and Peter, uh, my colleague, has just asked, how, any advice for keeping track of the numerous requests you might have filed at once? Do you keep a database or a list? Yeah, the, the first thing I like to do is to create uh, one email just for FOIA requests, because I, I have, say, like 6,000 FOIA requests only to the federal government. So I realized that if I use it like my professional account, and I change my job, for example, I would lose like all the, the FOIA requests. So I created a Gmail only for FOIA requests. And because I need to keep track of 30 days where they give me a response and then I send them a PO, et cetera. So I prefer to have my own email. I don't have a spreadsheet or, or something like that, but just having any, uh, a particular email just for FOIA requests, is, I found it that this is very, very useful. Uh, and about like the, the pitfalls, uh, one of the, the things that people ask the most is what's the difference between using FOIA requests or just asking the press office or, or something. And I would say the main difference is that press office, they send what they want. And in a FOIA request, you can ask whatever you want. Uh, one of the things that it, it's really important is that you don't need to explain yourself. You don't need to say that you are a journalist and you are doing a story about this or that. I know that, for example, in the U.S., some journalists, they like to explain what they are doing because if they don't do that, the, the, the agency can charge for the request. But that's not a thing in Brazil. So you don't need to explain anything. Just go directly to the point. I need data about deforestation in this area and the names of people who have been sanctioned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's it. You don't need to explain that you are a journalist or you are a researcher or that you are working for some organization. Just send your, your request. Uh, one thing that I, I like to do is to send, if, if I, I, I'm not sure about who is responsible for the information I need, and this is very common. So, for example, in Brazil, as I mentioned, we have two agencies, IBAMA and ICNBU. Sometimes I don't know exactly where to send my request, so I would just send both. I would send a request to IBAMA and another one to ICNBU. There are other agencies, state agencies, so Sometimes I can send you three or four. It's free. It's our right to send requests. So I think like some people feel guilty when they send something because they they think they are giving someone else their own their their own like they are giving something that's their responsibility to another person. But that's not like it. It's it's all right if you go to a public hospital. It's your right that a doctor will come and talk to you. So why would it be different with FOIA? FOIA is just asking the government to give the data that's not theirs. They are protecting the data, but the data is public. Everyone can access it. Yeah, something that uh, affects UK journalists a lot when they're filing FOI requests is uh, making sure that they've selected the right department and making sure that they're emailing the right person as well um, because there's nothing worse than waiting 30 days for a response uh, and then realizing you sent it to the wrong department. So that's also something to be aware of. And uh, in the UK, they also trip you up 
slightly, um, and I don't know if it's the same in the US as well, but they try to trip you up by making sure that you know specifically what the data refers to or what the name of the data could be. Um, it sounds like it's a bit more flexible in Brazil, which is fantastic. Um, but that's something that is a very common issue in the UK is not knowing particularly the specifics of the data. You have to kind of make almost a guess on, on what you are expecting to get back in your request to ensure that you get the right amount of data and the right data itself. Case has actually asked in the question in the chat, do you have any tips for formulating FOI requests? The more precise, the better. So one of the things that I like to do is talking to someone who knows the data before. I, I like to say that FOIA is the last thing you you use. First, you talk to people, then you read what's already available. You can talk to organizations that have the data. Sometimes, like in Brazil, we have an, one organization uh, and they have all the data about uh, murders in Brazil. It's weird, but the government doesn't have the most updated data about murders. So if you want to know more about homicide, you need to go to this NGO. Uh, and how do they get that? They send FOIA requests to every Brazilian uh, police department and they gather the data and create an, an annual report. And that's better than the government does. So uh, instead of sending FOIA requests to every state, you, you should just go to this NGO and ask them for the data. So... Uh, the first thing I like to do is like do some research, find out if someone already has the data. And if they don't, try to find uh, uh, the most specific way of asking that question. In Brazil, we have a very useful database of FOIA requests, and this is kept by the government. It's called Busca CGU, uh, where you can find more than 500,000 FOIA requests. So one of the things that I like to do is to look up in that database and see if someone has asked the same question before, how they ask if the government gave the data or not. So I can think a little bit more about the strategy that I'm going to use to get the information I need. But if you if you don't have a database like that in your country, the best way is just to do some research because as you said, it, it's awful to wait for 30 days and then you don't have the information you need. So uh, be, be precise. So if you want... Historical data, if, if you ju just ask for data, but you don't specify, I want this data divided by year, divided by city, divided by gender, by race or whatever, then the government can give you whatever they want. So be very specific, say exactly what you need. And even if you think they don't have the, the data in the way you want, just ask, because uh, if you don't ask, you are not going to find out if they have it or not. Very good advice. Uh, Tristan has just, my colleague has just shared in the chat. I, I've heard Kalina, one of our other colleagues, recommend 404 Media's FOI A for forums. Uh, and then I've just also shared What Do They Know, which is the UK site that you can check against freedom of information requests. Also, just as an additional thing, I think it's really useful to um, check on these sites for how people have written their previous requests as well as particularly if it's on similar data points because then you can see what has been successful and what hasn't as well in terms of language really great tips there you mentioned just before that you often check against other databases see if anybody else is already collecting this kind of information do you have any recommended databases or organizations specifically for deforestation in brazil that isn't the government or government related so uh, the most famous is Map Biomas. So Map Biomas is very useful, and they have data. Uh, they have special data from everywhere. Uh, you can go to uh, Inca. You can get some and just find the website. If you're listening on the podcast, I'll include the links to these in the description of the podcast. And there, there are some independent news outlets that I can't uh, avoid, like Info Amazonia. They are independent news organization. They have a, a lot of useful data. Um, there's another one called Ambiental Media. Let me just get their links. Uh, this is a new uh, non-profit organization, and uh, they are very, uh, very good in what they do. And, and they are starting to create like a data store where you can get some data for free, some data is paid, but uh, it's very, very useful for investigations because uh, 
I think they, they, they are based on official data, data from the government, but they treat the data, they clean the data, so it's much, much easier to just go there and, and get what you need instead of going to the government website. But of course, for, for some cases, using official data is better. Uh, I'll just share the link for the uh, Ibama data set that I mentioned several times. Amazing, thanks. Foulface asked earlier, what outcomes have you seen from reporting on this? Have you seen any changes in certification at all? So you mentioned the outcomes from the uh, landowner's investigation, but have you seen any changes or impact from uh, your work with ICFJ, for example? To be honest, I haven't been following up a lot on that story, so I'm not sure. I would say, I remember that when we asked them about what happened, the the certification, they said something like, oh, but these are old uh, cases or uh, it, we we are always checking companies again to see if they have uh, if they have changed their behavior. Some of the companies said that the fines were old, so they are not doing that anymore. But that's not exactly true because they have been fined like several times. It's hard to say because uh, in Brazil, uh, environmental crime is not really taken seriously. So most part of the time you just pay the fine and the fine is not that expensive if you are a huge company, if you have like a thousand uh, a cattle in your farm and paying like $10,000, $100,000 in Brazilian currency, of course, it, it's not a lot of money. So uh, it's hard to say. Sometimes they just pay the fine and then their names are clean and, and that's okay. So uh, I'm not sure. Maybe they, they they will be more aware of who they are giving the certificates to, but I didn't get any specific feedback on, on this specific story so far. Have you ever found trying to, as a freelancer, trying to source funding for these types of investigations difficult or easy? And do you have any tips for anybody who might be looking to pitch environmentally focused stories to outlets? So I, I would say that the environmental bit is one of the best to be a freelancer because there are many, many sponsors. So Pulitzer Center is a, is a great sponsor. Uh, the Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Columbia University that I mentioned earlier gave me, I would say that I, I, it wouldn't be possible to be a freelancer without their support because they gave me like a almost two years of support. And then I started from that to, to, to look for other, other partners. Uh, MuckRock, they, they gave me a grant a year ago to, to do some investigations. Uh, Environment. So uh, I forgot their name. Just just one second. From Internews. Yeah, Earth Journalism Network. Uh, they they give many many grants for uh, stories like that. One of the stories that I mentioned uh, was done through a, a, a fellowship they did uh, the International Center for Journalists. So oh, I think like uh, it's hard to pitch, and I think like the first one is always the worst, but then you get used to it. Uh, I think like each uh, each person, each organization is different. So the best way is just looking previous projects they have sponsored before, uh, and and see what what they, their, their their values are and what they expect from a story. And of course, you need to do some pre-reporting. It's impossible to pitch something if you don't have at least a part of your story already made. Uh, I, I try to pitch sometimes just with an idea and I, I received a lot of no's because you really need to have at least like some interviews. You make sure that you have a minimal story. For for OCCRP, for example, when I'm pitching a story for the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, they have a form. And in this form, you need to put your minimal story and your maximum story. So uh, the minimal story is like, uh, I know that 10 companies have been sanctioned for doing this, this and that. And the maximum story is that they are a uh, organized crime group who has been uh, profiting millions and they have, I don't know. But uh, uh, of course, you can dream when you're, you start your project, but you need to have at least something minimal because if you don't have that, they won't give you the money. Uh, if, if, you, if you can travel, if you, if you have details about like, the places where you plan to visit. This is, I think, this is the hardest part of pitching a project. Uh, it is like, how can you plan everything you are going to do in the next six months if you don't have the store yet? But sometimes, like Pulitzer Center, they ask you to explain where you plan to travel, where's the hotel you are planning to stay, and how much is that hotel costs, how much is the the the, the flying ticket, etc. 
So if you can, try to plan as, as much as you can because they, they will ask you for that. Really amazing advice. Thank you. Yeah, it, speaking from the Bellingcat editorial team as well, uh, we also ask for the minimal and maximum of your story. Um, so if you were ever to pitch an environmental focus story to us, we'd also be looking for similar information. Although you do not need to detail uh, your travels uh, or, or accommodation in, in our pitches. But yeah, that's a really, really good advice. Uh, you only have a couple of more minutes to pop in questions. So keep them coming, please, in the chat. I wanted to ask, uh, Luis, what from the investigations, what were your biggest learnings having kind of explored these data sets and, and finding kind of this uh, array of data that uh, is just producing endless investigations what have what has been your biggest learning from from these projects i'm not sure if i understood the question sorry what what have you learned from doing this uh research on these two and these three investigations that in fact they mentioned okay so i think like the main thing is is the methodology so uh as i said sometimes i think that the three stories are totally different. So uh, I, I I spoke with different people. Uh, I did different things, but the way I approached those stories was exactly the same. So I, I went to the data data set to the spreadsheet in this case with all the environmental crimes, and I asked some questions to that data. And then I spoke to people who worked for the, those offices. I, I spoke to people who worked for the companies uh, in the past. So I, I believe there's a methodology. If there wasn't a methodology, there wouldn't be so many journalism schools around the world, investigative reporting, workshops, and things like that. So uh, uh, I, I, when I go to a, a journalism conference, I hear that all the time. Like you attend a, a conference, you go, to, you, you attend a workshop, and they say, there's no single way to do a story. And I agree with that, but there is a methodology. And, and in stories where you need to fact check, where you, you have data, where you have public records, you you can at least try to do the, the same things. Of course, they won't work all the time, but at least you have something to start with. So, uh, and one of the things that I like about working with data is that you won't find just a single story. You can find several stories. As I said, like just using this environmental crime database from Ibama in Brazil. I have published, I, I have no idea about how many stories have been published based on that data set. Uh, and, and data fixers, the project I mentioned earlier, supported by Columbia, uh, the, the, the main source of this project is also the database. So the, there was this guy from Washington Post and he wanted to do a story about uh, uh, environmental crime. And he asked me a few questions that I had no idea about to about how to how to answer him. So I used the database and I found something that was useful for that journalist. There was another guy from Al Jazeera. He was investigated, investigating this politician uh, who was involved in environmental crimes. And I used the database again and I could help this this journalist to write his story. So I, I think that uh, when, when you, the more you explore databases, the more stories you will find. So don't give up. I think this is it's a valuable tip. Don't, don't give up on the, 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 the important uh, uh, sources that you have, if it's a human source or a database like that, because sometimes it, it, you won't see uh, the value of that source in the moment, but in the future, when you talk to someone or you are working on a different project, um, just go back and try to find, maybe you will find something valuable. That That's what I learned in this project. I'm still using the, the same database for several different purposes. Really useful. Um, sorry to take you back, but Felface has just asked how much information goes into a maximum story if, like he says, you haven't looked into it yet. So from Bellingcat's point of view, I just said it is what you think you might likely find. This could be a paragraph on what you suspect you might come across in the data. However, the minimal is what you've already found slash ready to substantiate. So how much detail, how much information do you usually give in, in pitches where you're asked to give a maximum story? How do you navigate uh, how much information you add there, and and um, what you what you can research uh, beforehand. I like to say that the maximum story is the dream. So, it, if you want to write the story of your life, the, the the story that you are going to share with everyone, this is the maximum story. Of course, uh, uh, you should talk about things that you think you can prove. Of course, you won't say like something absurd. But for example, I wrote a story about 
Uh, these people who were extracting Brazil wood, a rare type of timber in Brazil, they were extracting that, that timber illegally, making violin bowls and selling those bowls to Europe, to some stores in London. Uh, the minimal story was that I, I, I had a group of guys who were doing that for like a decade. That was the minimal story. But my I suspected that these guys were not like just some people. They were an organized crime group involved with very dangerous people who were involved in murder in other types of crime and they were working together because they could loan their money from what they are doing with timber and then support other crimes so i couldn't prove that when i started the project but because i had at least some tips some source telling me that that was going on so that was the maximum story the minimum story some people are exporting timber illegally and making violin bowls in Europe. Maximum story. These people are part of a larger organized crime group who is using the money to do other crimes. Really useful. It might be nice as well if you have any links to these stories, uh, including the the wood one that you mentioned earlier. If you could just add them into the chat, Louise, because I couldn't find that specific example. Um, and I'm sure people yes. who are listening would love to oh, sure. access it. The, the English version is is, is short. Uh, the, in, in Portuguese, we publish like three or four different articles, but this is to summarize in English. Amazing. Yeah, there, there are two stories in English. This is the other one. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll include those links in the podcast description as well if you're listening back on the podcast. We have time for a last few questions. So if you want to pop in a final question, please do in the chat. You've mentioned quite a few ways that perpetrators have been using policies and procedures uh, within Brazil to avoid taking responsibility. Is there any um, particular um, databases or procedures that you've come across that you feel could be useful to investigate further if anybody's listening to this and looking for a new investigative project? So uh, one of the most common ways of avoiding being sanctioned is to use a proxy. Uh, and there's a very effective method to find proxies in Brazil, which is the social, uh, how can I say that in English, social benefits database. So if you are a poor person in Brazil, you can have access to many, many social benefits. And your name will appear on the, the transparency portal, transparency website. It's called Portal da Transparência. Let me just give you the link. Uh, so... Uh, in most cases, what, what, what the criminals, what, what they do, they hire someone uh, and it's usually a poor person, a person who cannot defend themselves. Uh, 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 and then they put the farm in the name of that person. They, they, they put their company in the name of that person. This, this person is a proxy. But how can I know if this person is a proxy or not? Oh, if, if you are being sanctioned for uh, 10 million reais because you have destroyed a piece of land about um, I don't know, a huge piece of land, it's unlikely that you will be receiving a benefit from the government. So the first step we, we like to do is to cross-reference the data of the people we, we, we think is, is, a, is a proxy with that database of social benefits. Uh, or the, the most important social benefit in Brazil, it's called Bolsa Familia. I'll just put the name here. So there is a database for Bolsa Familia. There are other social benefits uh, during the pandemic, there was this social aid called Auxilio Emergencial. It's another way to to find the proxies. So I think this is very useful because it's the first way to look up some names and and, and find relationships. Uh, I think it's also important to mention this uh, project. I just give the link here. It's called Cruzagrafos. Cruzagrafos is a, an amazing project. Uh, where they they try to create connections between people, companies, and politicians in a in a visualization. So I I won't be able to to show it here, but you just look up the name of a company of a person that you are investigating, and then uh, if you click twice on the name, it will open all the connections of that person with a company. If the, this person owns a company, if they, they 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 are a director in a, in a company in a no profit etc you you will see the connection between the person and the company and you can just continue clicking so it will open more and more and more connections until you have something that is interesting to you and in in this uh, 
they are updating this database now to include environmental crimes. So if you are investigating a person, you just put the name of that person there, and then you keep clicking, and it, it will show their companies. And if they have an environmental fine, it will show up there. So uh, this this platform is very, very useful to investigate any person or companies that have any business in Brazil. Amazing, really useful uh, to be aware of some of these sites and databases. Obviously, we've spoken a lot about Brazil. Is there any particular organizations you'd point people towards uh, on a wider global scale? Or if there isn't, no problem, because I know you've been focusing in on Brazil itself. Yeah, I've been working uh, with two non-profit organizations, but I think like most people know about them. So Global Witness is one that is uh, supporting me in many, many different projects. And there's another one called CCCA. I always forget what it means. Let me just check. It's Center for Climate Crime Analysis. They are very, very good in, in, in fighting environmental crime in places we have no idea. So it's a very good source. Uh, they, are, they are based in Europe, but they do a lot of things in Brazil. But if, if you want to find more things in other countries, I think they are a very good source to reach out. Amazing. Thank you, Tristan, also for uh, linking it. I also wanted to shout out oxpeckers.org, which is uh, Africa's first investigative environmental journalism unit. I've worked with them previously. Uh, and if you're looking at areas within their regions, it uh, might be worth reaching out to them as well, because they use a lot of satellite data to track environmental crimes, organized criminal syndicates. So definitely have a look at that and have a look at some of the tools that they have on their site as well, because they develop tools exactly for those kinds of things, those kinds of monitoring, um, which is really useful. Last question from me. And then if we have time for anything else, uh, I will I'll pop it in at the very end. Oh, Godin, Jake Godin, who's also a colleague of mine, has just shouted out EIA, which is an environmental investigation agency as well, um, at eiainternational.org. But as I said, I will include all of these in the chat. So we've spoken a lot about databases and how you've used them in the past, how you've developed a methodology. What would be your final advice to anyone listening who is looking to start in environmental-focused investigations, hasn't even uh, put their foot in the door yet, Who, what advice would you give them um, if they're passionate about the environment but haven't quite tipped their toe in investigations yet? Um, what advice would you give? Uh, I like to say that uh, you need to start with a minimum story. So... Uh, uh... If, if you have a huge project in your heads, of course, congratulations, but uh, sometimes we don't. So start with, uh, with with something, a story in your city, a story in your neighborhood. There, there's always an environmental story, an interesting environmental story, and uh, uh, it, it's an infinite word. There's, there, there are many, many ways of approaching, of doing those stories, many uh, uh, tools, many databases. So if, if we try to do everything in a single story, you, it's impossible. So... I like to start with something simple, with, with a short story. So, uh, uh, like the first story I did was like about a politician who was responsible for committing an environmental crime in, in his in his property, and it, it, that that was it. Uh, just one story about this specific case. But because of that, I found out that uh, this guy had other properties, and the other properties were also involved in environmental crime. So there was another story that I could do. So uh, it starts simple. It starts with just one project. It, it, sometimes we don't even have a story. We just have like, we, we found out how to use QGIS. Write a blog post about how to use QGIS. Some, I, I, I spent like five years doing a newsletter about FOIA. Uh, it's called Don't Lie to Me because lie is the acronym for, for freedom of information in Brazil. So uh, and that was it. I, I didn't have a story, but I spent five years writing a newsletter to help other journalists do use FOIA in their projects. And it was very helpful because I found out many, many things about reporting, about how to use FOIA in reporting. So it started with something that you know you can do and that makes you happy, that makes you satisfied. Because if you don't do that, you're just going to give up. And uh, and that's it. I think uh, uh, the way to get to, to bigger projects is... To, to start with something simple. Really good advice. So you never know what you might find out. Um, is the newsletter still active? I'm interested. Uh, I know a lot of researchers that would benefit from that. 
yeah, it, it's still active. I'm not doing it anymore, but uh, I'll just keep building. Amazing. Uh, I will make sure to include that as well within the Discord, uh, within the recording notes. All right. I think it's time to call it. Thank you so much, uh, Louise, for your time today and your invaluable knowledge on covering environmental uh, investigations. Um, thank you to everybody who attended as well and for being in the audience. And this will this recording will be up next week uh, on our podcast platforms. Uh, keep an eye on it, but I'll post it in the, dis- uh, the Discord announcements channel when it's ready. Um, also, pay attention if you're interested in covering environmental uh, crime or environment in general. We do have channels within this Discord server. Uh, that are there for you to explore and collaborate with each other, uh, including the Environment Wildlife channel, which is often populated by Bellingcat environmental journalists, including uh, Peter, who's on uh, this audience right now. Uh, Tristan's just shared the link to it in the chat. Um, So please do check that out if you're interested in exploring some of these topics further. Um, And yeah, thank you so much, uh, Louise, again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I attended many, many sessions from Bellingcat and I I, I had ne- no idea that at some point that you would invite me to, to speak. So thank you very much and thank you for, for, for your time, for your patience. And if you have any questions, if you, you want anything from Brazil, just reach out. Definitely. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care and I will see you in two weeks time to the next Stage Talk. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Stage Talk. If you'd like to catch a stage talk live where you can ask the guest questions, join the Bellingcat Discord server by visiting www.discord.gg slash bellingcat. The music you've heard is titled Dawn by Newer Self and is courtesy of Artlist.